bear with me just a second. Let me get my pen working here. Let's see if that'll do it. All right, that'll do it. All right, my name is Meg, yeah, Meg Graham, and today I'm going to talk to you about the structure and function of skeletal muscle. Um, so let's start first by looking at the functions of skeletal muscle. And remember, this is going to be an uh, exciting lecture. It's about as exciting if I said, okay, today I'm going to tell you about the architectural design of this building. We're going to look at where every beam is, we're going to look at where every pipe is, and every piece of insulation. So I hope you don't get too bored, but we've got to get this out so you can understand skeletal muscle. All right, let's first start by talking about some of the functions of skeletal muscle. Obviously, it's going to be for movement. You've got to have movement of body parts, and so you use this skeletal muscle to do this. Skeletal muscle is attached to all the long bones of your body um, so that I can raise my arm, I can flip you off, I can do whatever you want, I can give you an ugly face, I can uh, make facial gestures. Um, it's needed for me to stand here and talk to you. I've got to have skeletal muscles contracting right now and holding me upright to maintain my posture. Um, I've got to have my joints stabilized, so my knees, so they don't buckle. I've got skeletal muscle that is contracting and stabilizing that joint and keeping it from slipping out of place. Um, we also use skeletal muscle to generate heat. When you're cold, you've got to have some mechanism to keep your body temperature in that homeostatic range, so your muscles will actually start shivering, and that's something that um, generates heat by using energy. When you use energy, Heat is a byproduct, so we can heat our bodies by doing that. And then, of course, we move fluids with skeletal muscle. Um, we especially move the lymph fluids. So when your tissue gets swollen and full of fluids, we use the lymphatic system to drain that out, and we use skeletal muscle to kind of help push that along. It's called a skeletal muscle pump. So we can use skeletal muscle for a lot of different things. Um, some of the characteristics of skeletal muscle include that it's electrically excitable. Now, you're going to hear a lot more about the action potential but all that is, is it's a, just an impulse, it's an electrical impulse that we use to tell that skeletal muscle, hey, let's shorten up and contract. And when we do that, as that muscle shortens, it pulls against some lever or bone in your body, and that's going to move a body part. So that's how skeletal muscle works, through these action potentials. So it's electrically excitable but we've got to make sure we get that impulse generated all throughout the muscle to make sure it generates a nice even contraction, so we'll learn how to do that in just a minute. Um, skeletal muscle also has the ability to contract, obviously, because it's going to shorten up when it contracts, and that's what's going to make it pull against something. And then you want it to be able to relax. Um, you don't want it to stay contracted up or you walk around like this all the day, so you have, have to have some way to relax that muscle, and your skeletal muscle does have that ability. If you look at a microscopic um, piece of skeletal muscle tissue, the first thing that you're going to notice is you have long, straight fibers. They're just long fibers. And they're actually the length of the entire muscle. So if I'm looking at a muscle that runs from my elbow to my shoulder, one muscle cell is going to be that long. That's a long cell. And because that cell is so long, it's going to have to have many nuclei to control it. Remember, the nucleus controls what's going on in each cell. Well, you need more than one nuclei to control this cell because of its length. So we say that skeletal muscle cells are multinucleated. So they're long and they're straight or unbranched fibers. They're multinucleated. And then you can also see in here that there's little bitty stripes. We call these striations. And these striations are due to regular repeating bands of proteins called actin and myosin. And we'll get into these a little bit more in a minute. Um, but they, they have these regular repeating bands, or they're, they're just set up like this over and over and over, and that's what makes this little striated appearance. Skeletal muscle is also voluntary, which means we control it. We tell our muscles what to do. Um, you don't tell your heart when to beat. Um, you don't tell your GI tract when it's time to go to the bathroom. You tell your skeletal muscles what to do, though. So if you say, oh, Mom, I'm sorry I accidentally flipped that person off. I couldn't control it. No, you control that. You're making your muscles, your skeletal muscles move. And, of course, remember they move all of the different parts, your head, trunk, limbs. They make facial expressions. You need them for eating, all sorts of different things like that. All right, well, if we start by looking at the uh, gross skeletal muscle. So we're looking at one skeletal muscle, and you see here that it's attached to bone. Okay, so there's our bone right there. And remember that bone... The long bones of the body are covered with this connective tissue covering called periosteum. 
So periosteum is the connective tissue covering on the bone. Well, that periosteum actually comes up where it attaches to the muscle and it, it merges with the muscle right here. And that connection point right there between the bone and the muscle is what we call a tendon. So a tendon is where a muscle attaches to a bone. That's all it is. And it's made of this connective tissue, dense connective tissue. Um, then this um, tendon actually kind of starts to fan out in a sheet and kind of wrap around this muscle. And that's what we call the fascia, which is just more connective tissue and it's just kind of covering um, the skeletal muscle. So the fascia surrounds the whole muscle. And the fascia kind of blends in with what's known as epimesium, which is that outer covering in the muscle. So epimesium surrounds the whole mun uh, muscle. Okay? And then if you look at the muscle, you see what it looks like right here. You might think, oh, that's one cell. It's not. That one, uh, that one little bundle right there is known as a fasciculus, okay? That's a bundle of muscle cells. So you have one fasciculus there, and that fasciculus is going to be surrounded by some more connective tissue, and that connective tissue is called perimesium, okay? Well, then you have, if you go even further into there, and you take this right here, which they've blown up, that's one fasciculus. If you look at the inside of that, each one of those little rods in there are actually a muscle cell. And they've pulled out one muscle cell to show you that right there. So one of those little rods is a muscle cell. So each muscle cell, and we use the term muscle cell and muscle fiber interchangeably. So if you say, I'm talking about a muscle fiber, you're talking about a muscle cell. But anyway, each one of these muscle cells is surrounded by some more connective tissue called an endomesium. So endomesium surrounds each cell. So if this is one muscle cell, then I've got endomesium surrounding that. Well, then all a, a group of muscle cells will get together. And let me find some pencils here to show you that. So if you get a bunch of muscle cells and you put those together, that's called a fascicle, and a fasciculus. And each fasciculus is going to be surrounded by some more connective tissue called the perimesium. So peri means around, so that connects, uh, connective tissue surrounds each fasciculus. And then you get a bunch of fasciculi together, and that's what we have showing here. You've got a fasciculi there, a fasciculi there, and that's what makes a muscle. And then all of these fasciculi are going to be surrounded by the outer connective tissue covering known as that epimesium. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. All right, well, let's look at one muscle cell or one muscle fiber. Um, remember, fiber and, cell, fiber and cell are synonymous when you're talking about muscles. Um, if you look at the muscle cell itself, we said it's um, surrounded by this connective tissue covering here. Okay, so that's one muscle cell, that's one muscle cell, and that's known as the endomesium. But then if you take this one muscle cell and you pull it out and you look at it, you see that it looks like it's got a bunch of little cells within it, all these little rods. Well, these rods are protein filaments. They're groups of protein filaments, and the proteins are myosin and actin. And we're going to learn more and more about these as you talk more and more about muscle. But they make up what are called the myofibrils, okay? So you have all these little protein rods. You group them together, and that makes a myofibril. Then you get a bunch of myofibrils. So you've got all these myofibrils. Group those together, and that makes one muscle cell, okay? Each muscle cell is going to be surrounded by what's known as the sarcolemma or the cell membrane. Anytime you see the word or the prefix sarco, that's going to refer to muscle. So in uh, muscle cells, we call the, sar uh, the plasma membrane or the cell membrane the sarcolemma um, just because it has different qualities. Okay, so here's the plasma membrane or the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. You also see a nuclei here, a nuclei here. Remember, these cells are multinucleated. And notice that they're long and they're unbranched. So all these are characteristics of muscle. There's another term here you see, sarcoplasm. That's just another word for the cytoplasm of a muscle cell. Um, and then, of course, you notice that it looks like it's striped here. You've got different like, um, little colored layers here. And that's what forms the striations. So these filaments, these myosin and actin filaments, are going to be arranged in regular repeating bands, and that's what gives it this striped appearance. If you 
blow it up even further and look a little bit closer in, um, you'll see more of what I was talking about. So there's the myofibrils. Um, remember, you've got bunches of these little rods that make up one cell. So this is one muscle cell here. And one thing that you notice in here, you've got your sarcolemma, that plasma membrane um, that's just been kind of peeled back so you can see what's inside the cell. Um, and then you have the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now that's a long word and you need to learn it and learn how to spell it. Um, basically what that is, it's a specialized smooth muscle, or, or excuse me, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So it's smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And remember endoplasmic reticulum is nothing more than a network of channels that kind of gives passageways throughout the cell. Well in muscle cell, remember I said we want that electrical impulse that is causing that muscle to contract, we want that to be generated all over the muscle cell at once so that we get a nice smooth even contraction. Well you need the specialized sarcoplasmic reticulum to do that. So you see it's got all these little tubular networks going throughout here and it just keeps running round and round all the way throughout this cell. It runs lengthwise with the cell. But then you also notice that there's some tubes cutting down transversely through the cell. Those are called the transverse tubules. You see that right there. Okay, they're transverse. They cut this way across the cell. So if this is our cell, you've got transverse tubules that go all the way through here. And what they're doing is they're bringing the information that's on the outside of the cell down into the cell because we want every part of that cell to get that impulse all at once. So the transverse tubules are going to be getting that information from the outside down into the cell. And then the sarcoplasmic reticulum is going to be carrying that information this way all through the cell. So you've got all of what's going on on the outside in one spot. It can be generated all of a sudden and just carried throughout that cell through this sarcoplasmic reticulum, this nice network. Well, if you look at um, the, the transverse tubule, let's say that's cutting across a muscle cell here. So it, remember, this is the outside and this is the inside. Well, the sarcoplasmic reticulum, where it comes up right against those transverse tubules, it's going to make these bulges. And these are known as terminal cisternae. So this network in here, as it opens up near the transverse tubules, so this is going to be your T-tubule or transverse tubule, right there, these are called your, sarco or excuse me, your terminal cisternae. So I'll draw a little arrow pointing to that. Okay. Now what do you need all these tubules for? What do, what do they contain? Well, they're full of calcium. You've got to have two things in order to have a muscle contraction. You have to have ATP for the energy, because you're going to use a lot of energy to have a muscle contraction, and you've got to have uh, calcium. Well, this provides the calcium, and it's able to dump it right where you need it. Um, and we'll see when we look even further on the uh, going down microscopically that this T-tubular system here where you have a terminal cisternae, a T-tubule, and then on the other side you'll have a terminal cisternae right here and right here they'll be bulging out. This is known as the triad. Three is what tri means. So the triad. You have a, one terminal cisternae, one T-tubule, and another terminal cisternae. So that right there makes up the triad and that's how we get the calcium dumped right where we need it. I know this probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense now, but just kind of learn it, learn just like you would be studying the pipes and uh, beams in this building, and then we'll figure out why we need all this later on. All right, um, you see down here you've got all these A lines, Z bands, and all that stuff. We're going to go into the next slide and look at that a little closer. So if you take your muscle cell, which is this whole thing right here, and you take out one myofibril or one rod of these protein filaments and look at it on a microscopic basis, you're going to blow it up like this, and that's what we're looking at. You see that it has these regular repeating bands. You've got these uh, thick bands, these thick red bands here. These are known as myosin. And then you've got these smaller bands of actin that just are kind of interspersed between them. But it's always regular and repeating. It just goes over and over and over. Well, you don't need to know A bands and I bands and all that kind of stuff. We don't need to learn all that details. What you do need to know though is from Z disk to Z disk, right here, Z disk to Z disk, this little piece right here 
makes up the functional unit of contraction for the skeletal muscle cell, and that is known as the sarcomere. You see that listed down here. So one sarcomere runs from Z-disc to Z-disc, and that's your functional unit of contraction for the muscle. Um, so what's going to happen is you've got these thick filaments known as myosin, and then you've got these, let me get a pencil here, these thinner filaments that are known as actin, and you have them in these regular repeating bands. So we would have you know, your myosin, thick filament, myosin, myosin, and then you'd have actin, actin, and then you'd have it connecting like this on the other side. Well, when a muscle contracts, all we're doing is we're walking those little myosin heads that you'll see in just a minute, and we're pushing it closer and closer together so that the whole muscle gets shorter like that. So if we relax it, we stretch everything back out. So in order to have a contraction, all we're doing is we're pulling the uh, actin closer in along the myosin, and that's how we contract it. Then we relax it like that. So you just need to know how that setup works. Um, let me make sure I hadn't forgotten to tell you something. I'm not following my notes, and that usually is a dangerous thing if I don't follow my notes. Okay, I think I've covered everything on that, so let's go to the next slide. All right, this is a, just a closer-up picture um, showing you the actin and myosin filaments. And basically, if you look at the thick filaments here, this, this thick red filament here, that's your myosin. And notice it has these little heads coming out on it. Well, those heads are the, what's going to grab on to the actin. So actin is going to be this little, it looks like a little curly cue network of dots, but actually, well, I'll show you in a minute what it is. It's like a double helix of proteins, and that actin right here, that's your actin, that's going to get caught by this myosin, and these little heads will just kind of do like this and uh, cock back and forth, and they're going to walk the actin along the myosin. So if this is my thin filaments, the actin, the little curly ones, and this is my thick filament, what happens is those heads will come down and grab that actin, and they'll just kind of pull it and shorten it up. So they'll grab onto it, and then they'll just kind of pull it and shorten it up like that. So let's look a little bit closer at um, how this works. But just remember the sarcomere, that's that functional unit, that runs from Z-disc to Z-disc. And that's that regular repeating bands of myosin, actin, myosin, actin, myosin, actin. And it just keeps setting up over and over again. All right. So this side here is a close-up of your actin and myosin. And the first thing I want to say is it calls these little heads cross bridges. Ignore that. That's wrong. These are the myosin heads, okay? So these are myosin heads. And they make cross bridges when they attach to the actin right here. So here's your actin. Well, when the myosin heads attach to the actin, then you say you have a cross bridge. Um, so this is kind of labeled wrong. All right, well, let's look at myosin. First thing you notice is myosin is this long protein filament, but it has this little double-headed structure sticking out of it. Well, the heads on myosin have two things that you need to know. First, they contain an ATPase. Well, you know it's an enzyme because it ends with ACE right there. That tells you it's an enzyme. So it's an enzyme that's going to um, act on ATP. We need lots of ATP for muscle contractions. So that's why we have that, and that's contained in that myosin head, and you'll learn about that later. The second thing that these myosin heads contain is they have an actin binding site. So they've got to have some way to connect to the actin. So there's a binding site that allows the actin and myosin to actually connect, and that's in that head. All right, then if you look at your actin over here, um, actin has actually got multiple parts to it. Um, the first thing that you have in actin is you have what's called their, your globular actin. And that's where you see all these little beads looking like things here, and they make chains. So let me draw one over here. So you have globular subunits of actin, and they make a chain, okay? And it's, this chain forms a double helix. So you have two chains, basically, of all these little globular subunits of actin. It's just a protein, and it just makes this little double helix looking structure like that. OK? 
Okay, so that's the first part of actin. Then you have something known as tropomyosin in actin. And that's where you have, it's, it, tropomyosin is a long protein filament and it makes like a ribbon and it just kind of covers right along here. And what it does is tropomyosin, and that's shown in blue here, that covers the binding sites for actin and myosin. So as long as this actin, or excuse me, this tropomyosin is sitting right here, you cannot bind these myosin heads to the actin. So it covers it up and it keeps them from connecting. Because if they connect, you're going to start getting a, an impulse possibly, and you don't want to have constant impulses. So you have to have some way to keep them um, separated. So that tropomyosin just kind of covers up those binding sites. Well, then the third part of what we call actin, it's really got three parts to it, is troponin. And you'll see that, that's this little molecule right here. And troponin has a binding site for calcium. Remember I said we had to have calcium in order for a muscle contraction to occur? Well, the binding site for calcium is contained in this little protein called troponin. And when calcium binds to that troponin, it's going to change the shape. Remember with proteins, shape is all important. So if you add something to a protein, you're changing its shape. And when that shape change occurs from the calcium binding, that's going to open up these uh, tropomyosin molecules. They're going to move out of the way, and that's going to allow the actin and myosin to bind. And you'll learn more about that later on. But hopefully you've got a, a basic framework to understand how skeletal muscle is going to contract. And uh, I hope that wasn't too boring, but we're done. Bye.